Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Marisa LaFleur, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Margaret Kimberly, presenting her new book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents, joined in conversation by Reverend Irene Monroe. I hope you're all well and safe out there. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these unprecedented times. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves right from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many questions as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Prejudential on harvard.com as well as a link to donate in support of this series and Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you very much for showing up and tuning in, in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, just to note, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise, but if they do, we'll, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. So we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so, so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Margaret Kimberly is a writer and activist for peace and justice issues. She is also an editor and senior columnist for Black Agenda Report, which she co-founded in 2006. And her work has appeared in the Dallas Morning News and American Herald Tribune, among others. Additionally, she contributed to the anthology In Defense of Julian Assange. She'll be joined in conversation tonight by Reverend Irene Monroe, who is a visiting researcher in the Religion and Conflict Transformation Program at Boston University School of Theology, and can also be heard on WGBH's Boston Public Radio segment, All Revved Up. The two will be discussing Margaret's latest book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents, which examines the legacy of each president in their treatment of Black Americans, even those who are often overlooked or are generally regarded as having been more sympathetic to the plight and, and interests of Black Americans. Dr. Cornell West has called Margaret one of the few great truth tellers and praised Prejudential, calling it an intellectual gem of prophetic fire about all the US presidents and their deep roots in the vicious legacy of white supremacy and predatory capitalism. Such truths seem more than most Americans can bear, though we ignore her words at our own peril. We're so honored to have them both here to discuss this book tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Margaret. Thank you so much, Marisa. Uh, thank you, uh, Irene. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so glad we have the technology and uh, we can uh, still do these, uh, these events. Uh, and thank you to Harvard Bookstore, of course, and to Steerforth Press, who uh, uh, published my, uh, my book. Um, there are so many ways to start this story. There are 45 stories in the book, one chapter for each president. Um, but I wanted to tie it all up in a way uh, that will bring us to the present. So uh, I've chosen to start out by reading from the preface, and this is a uh, quote from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, these are words that he wrote in 1956. He said, quote, in 1956, I shall not go to the polls. I have not registered. I believe that democracy has so far disappeared in the United States that no two evils exist. There is but one evil party with two names and it will be elected despite all I can do or say. And uh, I, I chose to, uh, to read uh, those words because we are in a presidential election year. Uh, here we are 64 years uh, after Du Bois wrote those words um, in the midst of an election uh, being told, of, of course, we're always told every election is the most important one because of Donald Trump's election and that um, 
uh, earthquake. It was a political earthquake, his election. We are told that this is an exa, he is an existential threat, that he differs from every other president and poses greater dangers than any uh, of the other men who held the office and that he must be defeated. But uh, black people face the same issue we have faced uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we exist and attempt to overcome uh, very deep racism. Um, uh, the foundations of this country are, are quite racist. Um, the foundations are a uh, foundation of anti-blackness, of genocide, first against the indigenous people and then against enslaved people um, who struggled, who survived, who got the right to vote. But ever since uh, after the Civil War, when some of us got the franchise, we are faced with this Faustian bargain time after time after time, trying to figure out who is best or least worst. Um, and uh, in this year, 2020, we're being told that there's this strict demarcation um, and uh, that that is the only way for us to think about politics. So, um, but it's a long story. So I, I uh, decided to start there and we will now begin our conversation. Well, thank you for that Du Bois uh, quote. You know, the very interesting thing, so that's 1956. Mm -hmm. uh, what, one of the things for folks who, who are listening and don't know is that Du Bois actually left America and went to Ghana. And on the very day of the March on Washington is the day that he died. But he always talked about that double consciousness. And uh -huh. so that's something that I, I, I certainly appreciate you opening up the, um, our discussion about. I think what, and because that double consciousness is always in every election in terms of the candidates that we choose here. So last week was the DNC um, and, and it was historic on, on, on many levels and I, I will get to that certainly. And then this week is the RNC and I was going to, I was going to watch it and then I said, nah, no. And so I, I, I didn't. Um, I, and I feel bad about it because I don't want to come across partisan. I mean, particularly one who has to write about about the election here. But I thought that um, your book was a shocker for me. One, mm -hmm. it's one that I, sh I wish I had uh, when I was going to school. Uh, it reminds me of Carter Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro, which is a classic. But it's really the miseducation of all Americans because your book is quite essential. So that that was one one thing. I have to tell you, though, I had some shockers. I mean... Harry Truman belonging to the KKK and yet uh, desegregates the military, another shocker. And I have to tell you, some of it has to do with Amistad, the book as well as the movie. You know, if, if, if you would say that there was a president that was really against anti-black violence and emancipation, more so than Lincoln, I would have certainly said John Quincy Adams hands down. But I thought what I would do, and I want you to talk about these guys, I thought we would talk first about the president. So we've had a, we've, we've had a black president, mm -hmm. okay? You say here that, um, and, and you, you're not alone, that, uh, that many felt that it was more symbolism than, than, than substance, um, that many felt that uh, it was, you know, he was the Joshua generation because it was the whole idea using the Exodus narrative of MLK, you know, that mountaintop speech, we will get there one day to the mountaintop. Explain to me why Obama, because now, because he was the dream. He's, he's the dream. He was the post-racial president. And all we talked about was race. We got to remember also is that the second, the second term, Black Lives Matter is formed. So help me with that because uh, Mitch McConnell will say this, uh, why, why are we complaining? We got the Voting Rights Act in 65, we got affirmative action and whoops, we got Obama. So help me with this. Well, you know, it's so funny. Uh, most of my life I've, I heard black people debate whether or not we would ever see a black president. And as I, um, educated myself politically uh, as my politics sharpened, frankly, I started to realize that even if we had a black 
president, we probably wouldn't get anything that was very much different. And I think uh, Obama proved me right. We live in an era where I think more so than in the past that the people we know that are called the 1% um, play a huge role in picking the president. Before anybody gets to vote in Iowa or New Hampshire, uh, they get to decide who is a viable candidate, that is to say someone they'll give money to and will promote and who is not. And in an age like, uh, like that, uh, anyone who uh, finally gets the nomination of a major party is, um, uh, owes a lot to those interests who, which are diametrically opposed to the interests of the people. So the banks, for example. So Obama was elected uh, right after the Wall Street crash of 2008, uh, a crash that was caused by the banks, caused by them with the bubbles they created. Um, and finally it all, as bubbles always do, they burst and millions of people were either unemployed or lost their homes or lost the values and value in their homes. But he's the guy they put in. So we see this man and that's why they chose him, you know. They have to have, uh, to have this veneer of democracy. You've got to have somebody popular. So George W. Bush leaves, he's not, popular. He'd stolen the election in the first place, uh, the Iraq war. So they had to have a Democrat. They had to have a Democrat. And to have one with the charisma that Obama has, his, um, his skills as a politician, um, smart man, they got buy-in for all of the things, the horrible things that presidents do. So the banks were bailed out and the people were not. We had uh, wars of imperialism, just as we had uh, with uh, other presidents. Uh, so Obama did what other presidents do. That's the best thing I can say, is that he did what the rest of them do. Okay. So he destroyed Libya. He tried to destroy Syria. So when you read about the ongoing refugee crisis in that part of the world, that is something that he and Hillary Clinton are responsible for. So, but black people still love uh, to see someone in our group succeed. And this is the ultimate success, success, being president of the United States. And um, uh, so people loved him and still do, and I think always will for the rest of his life, love Barack Obama, despite the fact that as a group, we don't have anything to show, aside from happiness, we don't have anything to show for his being in the White House. Okay, I, I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, you know why I'll give you that? Um, there was a time that my, my spouse and I, we were going to see uh, the Dance Theater of Harlem. They were coming up here and we were dining with two gay white boys. So we were out for the evening and they sat at the table and said, they got every, now mind you, we're gay too, okay? So they said, we got everything from Obama that we want. And Fee and I, we looked at each other and said, hmm, but, but, but I, I have to say this. I felt like, it's not that I'm giving him any slack, I, I, but I do want to know your feelings about it. Yes, he was a deported in chief and we're talking about immigration and that, you know, that was a really big, big issue at that time as it is today. But, but, but a lot was put on him. Was there a lot of expectation on him? And, and when you are the first, usually, isn't it more about symbolism than substance so that the next one that comes along can push that much further, which gets me now to Kamala. Now, Joe Biden has picked her as VP. He said just one term. Uh, is this Obama redux? Is this a nostalgic kind of narrative that America feels good about, can wrap its, you know, its arms around? Is, is it that? Because you just said that, you know, the person is picked long before we get to the ballot. Help me then to understand Kamala, because, you know, I'm jumping up and down because I'm saying that Shirley Chisholm, who, oh, by the way, I hear you from New York. What, what part? I, I live in Harlem. Oh, okay. Where did you grow up? But I grew up in New Rochelle in the suburbs. Oh, I won't hold it against you. Okay. You're not a real New Yorker. Okay. Because I, I just want to know. But anyway, to get back to Shirley Chisholm. She, so she was my congresswoman. She represented my, my area. And so I was, I'm saying Shirley Chisholm 
is looking down from heaven and just smiling because this will probably be our next, you know, person of color who is president. I mean, but, but you know, is it Obama redux, but pushed a little further? Yeah, it is. It's the same thing. She, um, uh, you know, it's a funny thing. When she was uh, uh, running as a presidential candidate, she withdrew. Uh, even bef before any of the primaries, because uh, she was likely to not do well in her home state of California. So there's a lot of symbolism here. There's not really a lot of strength as someone who would help Biden get elected. And right after the choice was made, what, head what did the headline say? Wall Street breathes a sigh of relief. Silicon Valley is happy. <laughs> so she's their person. And, that, and that's the way it works. You know, Republicans, the energy people love them. The oil companies love them. For Democrats, it's more often finance, capital, and uh, tech people who love them. But uh, she could be president. Biden is not well. I, I'm sorry. I don't care what they claim about him having a stutter or whatever. He seems to have some, I'm a lay person, I admit, but he seems <laughs> to have some kind of cognitive issue. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he won, if he did not serve out his full term and that she in fact could become president without actually having to run at the top of the ticket for herself. But we live in an age where um, the neoliberal um, uh, initiative is ascendant. And that means, what, what do I mean by that? So we have, we're living in the midst of this pandemic uh, millions of people are unemployed, but Congress has gone home. Uh, we got a $1,200 stimulus check. Some people who are unemployed, they did give them extra, that's 600 extra dollars. But people are suffering, and Congress left town. They came back out over the post office brouhaha. Mm -hmm. um, but people are, are quite desperate. But neither political party is addressing their needs. So we're going to see more of that. To make a long story short, that's what we're going to see. One of Biden's people said, well, if we win, there's not going to be a lot of government spending. Trump spent up all the money, blah, 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 COVID. So that's exactly what the people do need is government spending, a jobs program, uh, <clears throat> universal basic income, things like that. Yeah. But we're not going to get it. And we, we might, won't get it her either. We might get a WPA. We saw that in the 1930s. Do you, you I know? hope so. I hope yeah. so. Uh, you know, WPA <laughs> program, Civilian Conservation Corps. One of my, my uncles was in the Civilian Conservation Corps. That's the kind of thing we need. And it's the kind of thing that Black people, the whole country actually, whole country. should be yeah. demanding. But we are placed in this uh, situation where, um, you know, we fetishize the civil rights movement. But nobody talks about, I don't believe enough, talks enough about what people actually did. We had a mass movement of millions of people who confronted political power, who forced a president to do the things they needed him to do. That is how you get change in this country. But now we have a situation that's inverted and people are told that they have to be quiet in order to get what they want. You can't criticize Kamala. You can't criticize Biden. Oh, look, Trump. That's, you get that all the time. Do you want Trump? Well, no. But um, we have to talk about more than what's being offered to us. Um, the anniversary of the March in Washington is coming up in a, a few days. And, but we can't talk about that and not talk about the demands that people made. It was people, Black people in the South who did not have the right to vote, who got everybody the right to vote, who got a Civil Rights Act for everyone, uh, even though they were technically powerless. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say for our own sake, for our own survival, uh, stop treating these politicians like they're hothouse flowers and they'll fold if you make demands on them, we have to. Our, our survival depends on it. They can do it. We'll find out what they're made of, but we cannot say, oh, look, Trump, we have to have Biden. You yeah. can have Biden. Actually, I believe, and I, this is my, my newest argument, you're more likely to see a Democratic victory 
if there are demands made because they are going to try to do what they did in 2016 and offer the least and um, not get the turnout that they need. And then Trump gets back in through the Electoral College. I think if Biden and Harris are pushed mm -hmm. to offer concrete things that um, will help people survive, I actually believe that will make it more likely that they succeed politically. All right. I, I, I want to apologize to my audience. I'm sweating down here. I'm in the basement, okay? I, I, and I got these lights on and I can't have the windows open, so I'm sweating like a, a slaughtered pig. So I apologize to folks and to you and okay. stuff. But, but I want to ask you, since you said the civil rights, I do want to get to, to some of the presidents, but you brought up the civil rights movement. Are we in a third reconstruction? And let me uh, ex explain what I mean by this. First reconstruction, we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, okay? The second reconstruction, as I look at it, would be the civil rights movement. We got the Civil Rights Act of 64. We got the Voters Right Act of 65. We even got Mildred Loving. We got, you know, we got a number of things coming. Could this be a third recon, you know, and a lot of times we call the Civil Rights Act, uh, the 1960, that sort of second civil war. Could this be the third reconstruction? Because now we have a much more multi uh, uh, multicultural and uh, you know democracy it's more participatory mm -hmm. than ever ever before could this be as much as we feel like we're in a dystopian moment which we we are and i'm in a hot tub here <laughs> um, um, could could this be what we're seeing as a, a, a shift here that 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 you know as we as you know they say we expand and then we retract that this is the last of that kind of you know, this kind of ret retraction that we're seeing? It could be. It depends on us, though. Uh, we've seen uh, an inkling <laughs> of what could be after the huge protests across the country after uh, George Floyd was killed by the police in Minnesota. Um, that shows us that there are people who want change. And those, those demonstrations were, were so large not just because of the issue of police brutality. I believe all the issues I've mentioned, the uh, COVID, the unemployment, the minimum wage that hasn't gone up for years, the student loan debt, all of these issues, the lack of a national health care system. I believe all of these things came together mm -hmm. uh, to mobilize people to change, to demand change. So I think we could have it, but it's all about whether there's a mass movement. You know. Uh, Reconstruction came after the Civil War, an actual war where thousands of people died, the war that ended chattel slavery. Um, the Civil Rights Movement was a result of people making demands on uh, presidents. So it's up to us. That can happen. Yes, that could be true, but that's up to the people. All right. Well, listen, you know, I, we got to get to the Founding Fathers. Hamilton, yes. the Broadway show Hamilton really sort of popularized Every, our interest in, in, in the founding fathers and, and mm -hmm. how this country beca become what it is here and stuff. But, you know, there are a number of myths about, uh, about Washington. Um, and the, the, there's, there's two, of course, the, the cherry tree one you'll tell us about. But there's one about the slaves that, you, that I read in your book that was quite disturbing because we get this image that he and Martha freed them all. But it, it sounds like a different kind of a narrative here that, that just did not, you know, because it makes them look like Big Papa. Big Papa set them free. You know, it's the whole idea that, yes, but, you know, I come to the end of my life as I, you know, go up to heaven, I, I freed everybody. But it seems like there, there's, more, there's a, more, a, a more sort of odious backstory about, about Washington. Yeah. Well, uh, let's just talk about slaveholding presidents. Ten of the first 12 presidents were slaveholders. George Washington first became a slaveholder as a kid. He was 11 years old when he, his father died. He inherited uh, some of the enslaved people that uh, he, uh, his father owned. He married Martha. He owned about 50 people. Martha and her first husband owned about 200. Um, the okay. capital, the first capital of the United States, Washington was inaugurated here in New York City. Then they moved further south to Philadelphia. Then they moved further south to create an entirely new city on the swamp. Why is that? 
when he was in uh, Philadelphia as president, Philadelphia had a law. Any enslaved person who stayed in the state for six months could be freed. So he had a problem. What did he do? He rotated his enslaved people, made sure none of them stayed in Pennsylvania for six months. Uh, this meant that he and any others who came after them, after him had a problem. That is why they created a new city, built a new city in the swamp, safely between Maryland and Virginia in slave holding uh, territory. Although slavery was allowed in the North too, I hasten to add. But more de the South depended uh, upon it uh, more. Um, we know that, uh, I was always told that he had false teeth, his teeth were made of wood. <clears throat> some of his dentures actually contain the teeth of some of the enslaved people he held, whose teeth were yanked out of their mouths to help him make dentures. Now, tooth extraction is pretty brutal now with, um, with uh, modern medicine, with anesthesia. I cannot imagine having a tooth extracted um, uh, under such conditions. But that is the story of George Washington. Um, he and the other founders, he did not free any of, uh, upon his death, the people he owned were freed, uh, those held by Martha uh, and her late husband's estate were not. Um, and uh, uh, to the end of her life, she feared that they would kill her, that they would poison her in order to be free because when she died, those slaves owned by him and her would be freed. And so she ended up freeing them just because she was afraid they would kill her. So that's the story of Washington. He's followed by John Adams, one of the few non-slaveholders uh, yeah. among the early presidents from your neck of the woods, from uh, Massachusetts. Um, but he was uh, not anti-slavery as, as much as people like to say. He defended Southerners. He said they shouldn't be criticized. He said eventually they'll uh, end um, uh, slavery. He feared, he was terrified of the presence of free Black people. And uh, he was among the first presidents to espouse colonization schemes that would send Black people out of the country. He made his first public mark uh, defending the British soldiers at the Lexington uh, Max Massacre. Was it the Concord? No. Anyway, Lexington and Concord. By blaming Crispus Attucks, the black man, one of the first to die, who were always told he blamed Crispus Attucks for everything. And he didn't want black people to be free. And he, like all of the politicians of the day, compromised, that is to say, gave in to the slaveocracy and their demands. And that is the litany of presidents um, uh, for the first um, uh, 12 or so. Okay, okay. Well, we got to get back to, jo let's get back to John Quincy Adams. Okay, because okay. I read this whole beautiful book by David McCullough, you know, and I have to tell you, it's rather, you know, it's rather bold of you because usually when we think of presidential historians, they have been white men. I mean, I had before uh, this assignment landed on my desk here, I had just finished The Presidents by Brian Lamb. He's the C-SPAN the, uh, guy and mm -hmm. stuff. And so I'm always interested about, you know, what angle, you know, historians take about, about presidents. Well, well, we got to get back to John Quincy Adams, okay? Because, you know, we, not only do we love him up here, but we kind of love him. And I think he becomes romanticized again because of Amistad, you know, the movie as well as the historical, you know, legal argument. How do you wrestle with what he did for those enslaved, you know, Africans and, and what you've just said here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, how do you hold the, I mean, I'm trying to hold this tension together because I thought really he was the emancipator. Well, he was, uh, he had an unusual political career. He was uh, a one-term president, then he was defeated by Andrew Jackson, and then he be ran for office as a member of Congress. Right. Um, which I don't think anybody, any other former president ended up running for any other office. And it was in those years that he defended uh, the uh, enslaved people in the Amistad, just a reminder, um, they had been kidnapped from Africa. The Amistad, it's a Spanish word, means friendship, uh, was in Cuba. The ship was sailing from one part of Cuba to another. 
They rose up in rebellion. They took over the ship and tried to sail back to Africa. The sailors kept sailing north to the U.S. and the ship was captured uh, and they attempted to sue for their freedom. And John Quincy Adams was um, uh, among those who played a role in their um, uh, eventual freedom and argued quite eloquently in a Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. But as a member of Congress, he was, he's one of these people who said, personally, I don't like slavery, but the story until the Civil War is of constant compromise with the South. He did, he did I give credit, fight against the so-called gag rule, where uh, members of Congress were forbidden to talk about the issue of slavery at all. And he was one who argued against it. But at the same time, he would say things like, well, slavery is bad, but it's good for commerce. It's good for business. So none of them were really anti-slavery. Um, the personal, I've heard personally, I'm personally opposed. I don't own a slave myself. That was what you got in uh, most of the presidents up until the Civil War. And John Quincy Adams was pretty much uh, like that. All right, now let's go to the great emancipator. <laughs> 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 let's go to Lincoln here, okay? Uh -huh. I, you know, I, I have problems with Lincoln myself and the way that emancipation, that document went. It mm -hmm. was a provisional emancipation depending on where you were in the United States. Right. Meaning that if you were in Union states that had slavery, you still were enslaved, That's you right. know? But if you were in those Southern states that had succeeded from the Union, oh, you, you're free. And then of course, as the Western expansion, if they join the Union, all of that. So. You, you know, he, he gets a kind of prop that I don't quite quite understand because it's, it's, it's provisional because he's man maintaining what I call plantation capitalism, no matter how you look at it. But my question is, because you had said it in the previous statement, the colonization. So by the time Lincoln is president, it's up and running, the American Colonization Society. Right. Isn't that right? It's up and running then. Yeah, please tell me more about not only his provisional emancipation, but 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 all of that because I took that. Uh, can I just tell you what I took that as? Okay. I, 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 can, I took that as the and you'll say more the American Colonization Society. I mean, we get Libya. That's that's sort of we see the expansion of American imperialism over there in in, in Libya, right? But I also thought that he may have realized there wasn't a pathway to freedom for us, and that he was telling us we would do better to go back at this point. But you tell me, because what I read, I was shocked. Well, I was giving them, you know, some credit. <laughs> <laughs> I had always been taught that Lincoln uh, promoted colonization schemes uh, early in his career, early in his term as president, and then changed his mind and never mentioned it again. In fact, he never, ever gave up the, his dream for a whites only country. He never gave up his dream that black people would be sent out of the country. The Emancipation Proclamation was tied to a colonization scheme. They were both signed at the same time. And there was a colony that existed briefly in an island off the coast of Haiti called Ile La Vache. And they sent several hundred people there. The colony uh, they were not well provisioned, the colony failed, and they were, uh, those people were brought back. But he was very, very serious about getting black people out of the country. He never stopped talking about it. He had an office devoted to it. Um, just a couple of weeks before he was assassinated, he spoke to a former Union general by that time, Benjamin Butler, and took him aside and said, I hope you can come up with the plan to take Negroes out of the country. He never, ever, ever gave that up. Um, and he, in those waning days of the war, he proposed a huge reparation to the Southern states for the uh, loss of their enslaved uh, property. So that is Lincoln. Now he would also say if, um, uh, if slavery isn't wrong, nothing is wrong. So he would say things like that. In the second inaugural address, he spoke some very eloquent words about the uh, African-American soldiers, the US colored troops who fought in the war and how much they were owed. But 
in, uh, while in office, he acted quite uh, differently. The Emancipation Proclamation also did, it did one thing that was very important. It, it finally stated that slavery was um, the reason for fighting the war and it established the US colored troops. So I will say that with, uh, even with all of uh, Lincoln's other duplicity. But, um, but that's Abraham Lincoln, that is the truth. And then, you know, you were talking about McCullough and others. And one of the things I was struck by as I did my research is how much lying, uh, lies of omission and commission that uh, a lot of scholars um, take part in. Uh, this, the information that I have in this book is not hard to find. It's not locked up in the secret archive. If you investigate even a little bit, any of these presidents, all this information comes out if you're just willing to acknowledge it. So there's a lot of lies that we're taught in school, in universities. I was a history major. And half the stuff in this book, I didn't know until I started doing the research. So we have to... <laughs> We have to acknowledge the inadequacies of uh, the education that we get about history in this country. Yeah, you know, it's very, very interesting because someone, has, and, I, and, uh, and I've been talking to a couple of folks about it because, you know, this is a reckoning moment now we're, we're in. So they say we're in a reckoning moment and, and folks are asking how to be anti-racist and what do we do in terms of school curriculums. And I said that I think what we need to do, and I have to tell you because I was reading your book and I was just really annoyed because I really am a history buff. Uh, even when I was in college, when I wasn't partying, I was, <laughs> I was very much tuned into, you know, U.S. history a lot. And, 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 and I said, I think we need a moratorium on teaching history because, because uh, you know, teaching history to school age kids here at this point, all, all of us it actually, because now in this reckoning moment, we're taking down statues, you know, and, and, and we're correcting, like we're no longer, I, I, I hope we're no longer going to say Columbus Day, but you know, uh, we will, we will and, and we will look at quote, Thanksgiving very differently and stuff. I, I, was, I was very, I was very shocked by Lincoln. I was thinking nothing could shock me because, you know, the 54th Regiment left here, left here. Yes, yes. yes. You know, Frederick Douglass, son, uh, was in it. Uh, this was the epicenter, you know, of the abolitionist movement here with David Walker's appeal. Although we do have the Royal Slave Plantation that is in Medford, just about 17 miles from here. So, I mean, you know, I always tell people, what the Mason-Dixon line does, if you're below it is down south and if you're above it is up south. But the, but the point is though, I, I, I gotta push you a little more about, uh, just about Lincoln. I'm not trying to save him, but I'm really trying to really understand here. How then do you, how do we reckon? How do you think we can reckon with this kind of iconic narrative? How do you think we can begin to correct that? Now we're taking down here, here, up here in Massachusetts, a statue of Lincoln, where you have a, a, a slave boy at his at his feet. Oh yeah, a horrible statue. Yeah, yeah we're going to take that, and and then when we we do that statue, we're going to talk about Theodore at the American Museum of History because this is what got you, you know, engaged in this this yes. you know this quest. But how do we reckon with what do we do with such an iconic? You know, I think things like if you say there's certain presidents you say, well, look, I didn't think, I don't, I didn't know much about them anyway. You could correct those histories, but this is an iconic one. Yeah. Um, uh, Lincoln, I mean, it, you know, Obama, I think, you know, he rest his story. I mean, he started his, um, his campaign in Springfield, Illinois. So how do we reckon with such an iconic narrative as this? I, I think we just have to start telling the truth and we have to acknowledge that people have feelings about it. It's hard to be told your entire life, nothing, but good things about Abraham Lincoln. And then somebody, I write a book and I come along and I tell you, well, actually, a lot of that's a lie. Um, it, we, it has an impact on us personally. Yeah. So we have to acknowledge that that's true, but then we have to just plow through it. Um, that's not a reason to hold back. I also think that we need some new heroes. You know, um, uh, presidents, I mean, we have Presidents Day. Um, uh, presidents are in this, you know, pantheon of uh, nobility and heroism. Um, but we need new heroes. 
We need to make John Brown a hero. I tell people, if there's a white man from the 1800s you want to admire, it ought to be John Brown. All right. The raid on Harper's Ferry was intended to start a slave insurrection. Even though he failed, he succeeded in starting the Civil War, which was a good thing because that hastened the end of chattel slavery in the country. So we need to talk about the people uh, whose names we may not know. Uh, a few days ago was the anniversary of Nat Turner's uh, slave rebellion in Virginia. He needs to be a hero. We need to talk about Harriet Tubman. She was on her way to help John Brown. And I actually, fortunately, she did not get there in time and she lived to help fight the Civil War. But we need to raise up other people. We need to talk about the indigenous people. We need to talk about Tecumseh. We need to talk about Sitting Bull. We need to talk about how they resisted um, uh, the encroachment upon their lands. We need to tell it. We need to give people space to say, this is difficult for me. I always admired Lincoln, and now you're telling me I can't listen to them. But that does not mean we stop. It does not mean we change what needs to be said. It means that we go on. And I think people, um, despite these difficulties, uh, they can take it, um, especially kids. They will learn yeah, whatever you tell them. Yeah. Um, that'll be the easiest group to start with. We can um, prioritize uh, the, uh, the kids and the youth. Okay. Um, and they will take in the information with less resistance, I think, because they just because they've been taking it in for less time. But we also have to talk about why people have those feelings. Most people want to have a positive feeling about their group. And it could be their ethnic group, their religion, their, their nation. Um, and you, so you are, in effect, yes, you are taking something away from people, but you're also giving them something. You're giving them truth. And you're telling them um, what you should admire. If you say America is a great country, well, does that mean admiring? People ask me after my research, who's the worst president? And I always say Andrew Jackson. Um, he is the man who uh, um, conducted the ethnic cleansing in the Southeast, displacing the native population, and turning that into the center of uh, the plantation economy and starting uh, decades of suffering for enslaved people. So we can say that. And take him off the $20 bill. Just take him off. Um, you know, first we put Harriet Tubman on, then it was, we'll share it with her and ha Andrew Jackson, an insult to her, in my opinion. Just tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth about the abolitionists. Uh, tell the truth about the enslaved people who escaped. Tell the truth about the people who, um, who fought against the official narrative at great risk to themselves, the John Browns. Uh, the people who, um, a man in Colorado, there was a terrible massacre, the Sand Creek Massacre, and there was an army officer who told the truth and he paid with his life. He was assassinated because he told the truth. Make that man's name known. And I'm blanking on his name, in fact. I know what he did, but I can't think of his name. But um, we're, we can take it. We will not get the vapors and faint. Well, maybe some people will. But we'll, you know, hold some smelling salts and, uh, and get over yourself. But well, you know, I, I think we have to be committed to, we must be committed to the truth. Let people talk about how they feel about the truth. But that should not stop us. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very much about let freedom ring here. Uh, you know, I think of Monument uh, Row down in Richmond, Virginia. But, uh, you know, we're fighting up here uh, mm -hmm. around about the issue of Manuel, uh, Faneuil Hall because he was a slave slaveholder. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is I was, I was envisioning this whole idea that if we got rid of everything, there, the America we know would not exist because I, I could just see all these statues down, just re really, because it really was built on an enormous lie. You know, we talk about, you, you know, the lost cause myth, which is particular to the Civil War, but the, but the whole idea, you know, uh, all of it has been built on a notion of anti-Black violence to uphold white supremacy. So you begin to see this, and I'm hoping that in this reckoning moment we can do this. But I just want to do one more before we do Q&A, because it really was really the catalyst and impetus 
for your work. And I need to tell you your, your footnotes, because I'm a person like, how she know that? You know, how you know that? And so your work is not only it's subjugated knowledge that you bring to the fore, but it's also subversive because I read your footnotes and then I go, you know, you go check out the foot. I was like, girlfriend is fierce. I mean, so I, I, I really appreciate that people don't realize the, 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 the laborious work you had to do because this is so subjugated now. So when I go back and I think of David McCullough, well, he had it easy because he's just repolishing and glossing over and David Lamb, you know, of, a, of, na of stuff we're all familiar with. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's just giving it these kind of literary flourishes, you know what I mean? To make us feel good. But I, I had to sit up <laughs> and, put, and put on some another pair of glasses and say, let me read that, <laughs> let me read that sentence again. But Theodore Roosevelt, Yes. Ooh, okay, so you Teddy, know, Teddy Bear. the American Museum, the National Museum in New York, um, they're yes. going to take it down. They said it's they not did. Going to, Yes, they did. Okay. Well, they are going to. I'm not sure. When, uh, okay, I thought they were going to. They're going to. They said it's not about his horrid, <laughs> odious history, but it's about the hierarchical composition of the piece. Okay, but I had no idea his animus towards Native American. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what a white supremacist he was because, look, if you're New York, you know, it was called New Amsterdam. So the Dutch settled this area, you know. So I was just shocked. <laughs> I need to tell you, I was just shocked. So, yeah, I, please tell more about Theodore because he's the one that gives us, you know, muscular Christianity, all of this, the frontier, the, you know, all of this stuff. You know, he's a big hero. Yes, he is. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you're just to tell the audience, there's a statue in front of the American Museum of Natural History. Roosevelt is on a horse, and there's two men beside him, a Native American man, an African man. Uh, and it, yes, it is indeed very hierarchical. Uh, I never loved it. I always wish they would take it down, and the museum always uh, argued against it. But finally, in this era of uh, when monuments have taken so much meaning, they finally had to admit that it had to go. Uh, Roosevelt is a person, he was born here in New York City. Uh, as you said, he was, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was his distant cousin. Eleanor Roosevelt was his niece. Uh, anyway, he was quite a white supremacist. He, um, uh, he was quite, quite a um, imperialist. He was unapologetic about it. Although there's one story, I want to tell the story real quick about him and Booker T. Washington. He invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, right. which was sort of in contradiction, but it was kind of a noblesse oblige sort of thing. He invites George, uh, Booker T. Washington to the White House. There's this firestorm that a black man had eaten dinner at the White House. And to make a long story short, after it was over, uh, his office announced that, because it was known by many names, the executive mansion, the president's house, so he said, it's officially called the White House, just to make sure. He talked about his white Navy that would go around the world and bring civilization. Um, his war in the Philippines, started by his uh, predecessor, McKinley, who was assassinated, was very, very brutal, very vicious. But uh, he talked about civilizing uh, people even as they killed him. He talked about the obligation of white women to have babies That's right. and make sure that the white race um, uh, stayed uh, numerous and, and strong. One of the most disgraceful things he did, uh, there was a group of black soldiers who were sent to uh, an army base in Texas, in, uh, uh, Brownsville, Texas. They were, from the moment they arrived, they were under uh, assault by the local population. There was a shooting they sought to defend themselves. And these men were all um, threatened with court martial, some of them with uh, hanging. Theodore Roosevelt waited until after election day. Now at this time, black people were still Republicans because Republicans were the party of Lincoln, the Democrats were the party of the segregated South. Uh, so black people still, those black people in the North who could vote, voted for Republicans. He waited until after election day to announce that all these men would be court-martialed, they would be kicked out of the army, they would not get their benefits, um, and uh, some of them would be imprisoned. Uh, that, was, that was quite awful. He defended himself. There was one Republican senator who spoke up 
man named Foraker, who never, who publicly um, challenged Roosevelt and lost his uh, Senate seat as a result. But Roosevelt said, I don't care. I don't care if I'm impeached. Um, they were all murderers and killers. They all got what they deserved. He even said once in a speech, uh, lynchings were the principal cause of lynching was black men raping white women, um, giving voice to the uh, oldest and most dangerous canard uh, used in uh, the uh, uh, violence, mob violence against black people. Amen. So that was Theodore Roosevelt, erudite, Harvard educated, um, you know, aristocratic family, wrote Manly man. Talk, writer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when it came to uh, Black people, he was an outspoken white supremacist. I, I, I had no idea. I was, <laughs> okay, I was shocked. We have a couple of Q&A okay. here, Can, and I, I want to uh, ask you this question here, Margaret. This is from mm -hmm. someone in the audience, and it says, what were, your most what were you most surprised to learn about the policies and legacy of the lesser-known presidents you researched? Well, the... Um, the, ah, oh God, you know, what do you know about Millard Fillmore? But I'd say the one who loomed largest in my mind, hold up, was Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan was Lincoln's uh, uh, predecessor. He is the president, uh, he was president th at the time of the Dred Scott decision. Okay. Uh, as we all know, Dred Scott sued for his freedom, Supreme Court ruled against him, uh, not only did they rule that he could not be free, despite the fact that he had spent time in a free state, they just said that no black people had citizenship rights, whether slave or free. Uh, Buchanan colluded with the Supreme Court mm. to make sure not only that they ruled against Scott, but that there was this decision which dispensed with black citizenship. He improperly interfered with the work of the Supreme Court to make sure their decision was as damaging as possible. He hoped to end all talk of abolition altogether. Uh, so he's a lesser light, a footnote, the guy before Lincoln, but he uh, played a role in um, uh, bringing about this decision. So he's, if I had to pick one, I would, I would pick it. Wow, okay, there's another one. It says, I was amazed that Biden claimed Trump is the first racist president comment. Yeah, that is kind of amazing, isn't it? Is it is very funny. He's, <laughs> I'd say Trump is unique in this era in being um, very openly racist. That's, that's the difference. But let's, but let's talk about the other presidents of this era very briefly. Ronald Reagan. Okay. Remember his, uh, his uh, stories about welfare queens and a strapping young buck getting food stamps and his uh, going to Philadelphia, Mississippi, a state he didn't need to, to win, um, the place where the three civil rights uh, workers were murdered. And he talked about states' rights, uh, code words for uh, upholding segregation. Democrats were no better. Jimmy Carter, during his campaign, school busing was a big issue. And he said he saw nothing wrong with keeping ethnic purity yeah. in uh, neighborhoods about uh, fighting uh, against uh, alien influences in uh, neighborhoods. Bill Clinton um, executed a mentally ill black man uh, when he was on the campaign trail. His sister sold John Mova to embarrass Jesse Jackson. His photo op uh, at Stone Mountain, Georgia, the home of the KKK, where he posed with black men in prison garb to make it clear that he was going to be tough on crime. Uh, Trump differs in his crudeness. He differs in his lack of uh, finesse, but he's not the first racist president. We have to stop saying that, saying that he is uniquely evil. Um, he isn't. He just is not. And uh, Biden, let's talk about some of the things Biden has said. Biden was, he made a political career <laughs> opposing busing and a great irony of history. Kamala Harris came at him in a debate to, to uh, attack him on that as well she should have. Um, he made a comment about his kids. I don't want my kids growing up in a racial jungle. We've got to do something about busing. So, so no. He, and let's not forget Anita Hill. Come on now. Yes, yes, the way he treated Anita Hill. 
So um, uh, it, it's just not true. It's easy to, Trump is unique. He's, he's, he's personally vile, just as there's no covering it up with him. I, I think that's what, in addition to his policies, I think as a person, um, he is uh, such an outlier that it, uh, his presence triggers so many people. And his election was a shock. He, was, he kept being told he couldn't possibly win. He won't get the nomination. He got the nomination. He can't beat Hillary Clinton. He did. There was cheating, I believe. I believe it was stolen from Hillary Clinton. And I find fault with the Democrats because they never brought that up. But uh, no, they, Trump is not unique. Okay. If he was unique, there'd be no reason to have written the book. Okay. Can, can we take one more? Or are we out of time? Yeah, you can take one or two more. Okay. Why do you think it is most, what do you think is the most important thing that can be done by regular citizens to break this seemingly endless cycle of politicians failing to represent us and protect black lives and then later being lionized for doing the bare minimum? I love, I love that. That's a great question. Yeah. What we have I mean, to do, really. as, I, as I said earlier, we have to stop, um, uh, propagandizing about the civil rights movement and do what those people did. They did not care what people in power wanted. They had a demand, a concrete demand. Give us the vote and Jim Crow. That is what we must do. And we cannot be uh, hand in glove with the Democratic Party. We have to have an adversarial relationship with um, uh, with politicians. And I also saw somebody telling me the name of the man I refer to, Silas Soule. He says, thank you so much, who was the man who um, uh, told the story of the massacre and paid for it with his life. Thank you so yeah, much. For yeah, that's what's helping okay, me out there. Can you, t can you take one more? Yes. Okay, let's just, let's give it a try. Okay, he says, I think there's now more explicit pessimism about the possibility of Blacks ever reaching equality. Has this pessimism always been there, or is it now just being expressed more openly? Uh, I think it comes and goes historically. We are optimistic in a certain era. Then there's always um, a um, um, there's always an attack on the progress we've made. So it comes and it goes. I just have to say we can't depend on electoral politics, and we have to think. We really have to think about creating a new society. We have to think in revolutionary ways um, about the kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, country and world that we want. Um, the um, capitalist world is in great crisis. It cannot be held up. It should not be held up. It needs to go. We need to figure out what comes afterwards. But you know and what? That's a big issue, but that's my. <laughs> yeah. But Margaret, I don't, I don't think we're pes pessimistic. I think we've always been cautiously hopeful. Mm -hmm. I think that, I don't think pessimism is what would describe us because we wouldn't have had the kind of movements, the sit-ins, mm -hmm. the kind of, you know, black agency that we see, or even revolts during, during slavery. So I don't mm -hmm. know if it's, it's actually pessimism. I think what it is is that, like I was going to say, we're, just, we're, we're sick and tired, of, as Fannie Lou Hamer would say, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of waiting for our moment. And I think that in where maybe our generation was the, the beneficiary of the civil rights movement, our children are not going to wait. They don't, you know, each, each generation pushes it that much further. So I don't think it's pessimism. I think it's about this, this, is, the mo this is where we need to push America. You know, so I don't know. Well, we need to follow the young people. They're facing a very different world than we faced. Um, I, there was never any question after I got out of college that I would get a full-time job with benefits. Of course you did. You went to college. Yeah, right, now we've got a gig economy. We've got, um, they are dealing with a completely different world. And we, I think, have to take their lead because they are seeing a system, they are the ones living with the system in collapse. Right. Um, they are not going to have the things that people of my generation had. And we have to acknowledge that this system is not sustainable as it is. That's the optimism. That is the cause of optimism. We cannot rely on a system that has lost all legitimacy. 
um, to, uh, to sustain us. There's no nibbling around the edges. There's no reform. We have got to look at creating something new. That is a huge task, I say. Even <laughs> I point out even as I say that. But I think it's, it's, it's crucial that we admit it and start talking and debating and arguing and fighting with each other about how to bring that about. All right. There's one more question, uh, the only one left in the queue. Do you want to go with it? Sure, let's try. Okay, it says, uh, what do you make of Adolph Reed's critique of identity politics? Ah, that's, that's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, identity politics can get us into trouble. Uh, as I was pointing out with Obama and Kamala Harris, we may, you can end up with the same policies that have uh, created a lot of suffering. But if it's someone who looks like you, then you let things slide. That can be very dangerous. I think, I think the uh, way to handle that is to make clear that the people must come first. And we promote people who do that for us. We have to talk about a country that has a living wage where you don't have to go into debt to get an education. Uh, where homelessness, I mean, homeless encampments, I have never seen anything like that. A country that has justice around the rest of the world, that uh, does not think it's okay for the United States to decide who runs Venezuela or who runs Libya or Syria. <laughs> We've got to fight for all of those things. And I think the issue of, of identity politics will take care of itself when we fight for justice for everyone at home and abroad. Yeah, I, I think identity politics works best when we have a kind of intersectional kind of goal and, and, yeah. and, and model to, to fight so it doesn't look like a hierarchy of oppression. No, you no. Know that, so we're looking, you know what I mean? So I think that it, it's important. It, it, it really does because we're no longer that melting pot, uh, melting pot. I grew up with that kind of notion. You yeah. know, but, but, <laughs> but, but I think it works when it's intersectional and stuff. So it looks like we have come to the end of our our chit chat here. Oh my God, it went so fast, Margaret. It was wonderful. Um, I, I apologize to you and all, but I'm down here in a sauna. So as much as I hate for this conversation to end, I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. It was great. This was fun. Yeah. And I can't believe we're hours gone. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you both so, so much. Um, and thank you to everyone out there for spending your evening with us. You can learn more about this important book and also purchase Prejudential at the link that I posted in the chat. Um, and otherwise, on behalf of Harvard, Books, Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, please have a good night, keep reading, and be well. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Love. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> Stay safe, everybody. Margaret, okay. it's people off. Are you okay? Was it? Did it?